Okay. Um, now we're going to have one of our own, Dr. Chip Cohen, who is a director and a former vice president uh, of the radio club. Um, he has his own company. And he's got a whole bunch of his folks here. He and Ryan Thistle are going to talk about metamaterials and that's that's uh, the screen one. There's two mics. One that's what both on. Yeah, that's the other. And so they're going to talk about metamaterials and creating essentially a more directional antenna um, using fractal technology. So, and they have a demonstration, which is always cool. So, Chip? Thanks very much. I mean, I can do fractals, but I'm, I'm not sure I can do microphones. Let's see. Is this frequency in use? Is that working? Yeah, it's working. Okay, great. So that goes in pocket. This is one of the disadvantages of wearing a bolo tie. Okay, is that, is that working? Great, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yes, uh, so my colleague Ryan and I are going to be giving this talk. There is a demo which is a prominent part of it. So what I'd like to do is uh, I'm going to run the PowerPoints and basically set up the whole puzzle for you on what you're going to see and the physics parts that go into it. You're going to see not new physics, but new applied physics. I want to make that distinction. There's no magic going on here. All the physics was well known. It just wasn't put together in one synthesis to make a new device. So uh, what I need to do in order to do that is to move ahead and show you the pieces that go into it. Let's see if I get this. Or did I just turn it off? <laughs> the right one. There we go. Okay. So basically, uh, I'm, I'm going to assemble the puzzle for you here first by uh, pointing out uh, uh, the phenomena that are important to it and the things that were made using those phenomena that were examples. And uh, it's going to go all the way back to 1820 with Young's double slit experiment and end up into 2017. The significance of today is not so much that what I'm going to show you was made over the last few weeks. It's that the first patent finally issued on this stuff was first patent was submitted in 2008. So you can see how long it takes to get some of these patents. So I waited until this patent issued before the company moved ahead to do uh, to do this technology. Obviously, we'd done the experiments ahead of time and understood most of the physics. Some of the physics is certainly for the interested student, as they say, and we'll probably see a bunch of PhD theses come out of it over the next few years. Uh, one of the points that I, I do want to make here, is there a laser on this? Yeah. Center. Hey, okay. Thank you. All right. Is uh, fractals are in elect electromagnetics are not new, and in fact, um, the 30th anniversary of making fractal element antennas happens in a few weeks. It was done over Christmas vacation uh, in my apartment uh, in 1987. So some of these things have very humble beginnings. It's kind of interesting to see how they piece together. So uh, let's start with the beginning here and go back to um, the concept of interference. And when I say interference, I mean things adding up constructively to produce gain. Uh, in uh, 1820, Thomas Young, who was a physician, I might add, uh, came out with a so-called double slit experiment. And what he was able to show is that if you had two tiny slits and you excited them by one wave, that it would produce two independent waves and they would add up in the center and give you a stronger wave and then produce these things which you now call side lobes as you went away from the center. Now, the thing that's important to realize here is you can see these side lobes decrease in intensity as you move away from the center. And in fact, when you get down to here and here, the side lobes go to zero. So hold that thought for a minute. Now, everyone learned this in school. It's, it's cool. You probably did the experiments with a ripple tank if you're an old person like me. And uh, the bottom line is, what are, what are the limitations in understanding what, what goes on in this, this experiment? And the answer is, is, don't get too hung up on what the double slit experiment means. It shows you the principle of interference, but it doesn't give you the prescriptive limitations of interference. And 
uh, there's been a number of rules of thumb that people have adhered to that really get in the way. For example, one of them is that, is that you should never in general put these slits or any other elements to make interference constructively closer than about a half a wavelength from each other. Turns out that's nonsense. You can get them a lot closer, the gain will start going down, but you still get gain as you get them closer. The other thing is the assumption is that there's no interaction of the slits or elements, as it were, as you get them closer together, that they're independent. Turns out when you get them close together around an eighth of a wave or less, they become very dependent on each other and some new phenomena happens. The other point is that right now, you know, this experiment basically shows two collinear slits, one above the other, producing this constructive interference. In other words, this gain here in the center. But in fact, if you had put a slit over here, or if you put, you were able to do it so there was a slit in front of another one, in, by analogy, you would also produce an interference pattern and get gain. Which brings me to my next piece of the puzzle, which is uh, interference with parasitics. Now, the two slits were driven. That is to say, you hit them both with a wave and they produce new waves. What we're talking about here is something that's very familiar to everybody, and this idea of a Yagi antenna. By the way, Yagi did not invent the Yagi antenna. His graduate student, Uda, invented the Yagi antenna. So we really should, at the very least, call it a Yagi Uda antenna or just an Uda antenna. So this gentleman here is Dr. Uda, and this is Dr. Yagi. And uh, it's too bad there's not a picture of them both together. I don't know what that says. <laughs> In any case, uh, here's, I think we all think we know how a Yagi works. In fact, it may not work the way you suspect it does. So I'm just going to go over the very basic physics of it. First of all, the parts, of course, are reflector. That's a parasitic element. It acts like a reflector. The driven element, which is the only one that's connected to the transmitter. And then these parasitic directors. And of course, the more directors you get along the boom length, the more gain you get. Keep in mind that as you get longer and longer in this boom and more and more of these elements, the incremental increase in gain becomes uh, very small. So it becomes asymptotic and it becomes impractical to make a, uh, a Yagi more than, you know, there's a rule of thumb of roughly 15 elements, but, you know, some people have made Yagis with 200 elements, which is pretty bold if you ask me. Here's how a Yagi works. I'm just going to take it with the driven element and uh, the director. So you know how a driven element works and you get a nice sine wave that's propagating forward. What happens is that sine wave hits the director and excites another wave, but it's 180 degrees out of phase. So it generates a second wave, which is 180 degrees out of phase, but there's also a phase advance, a little phase difference that corresponds to this separation in, in distance between the director and the driven element. So that 180 degree out of phase on the, on the director plus its offset produces a second wave, and when they both combine, you get constructive interference, not 100%, but enough to produce gain. And the more of these directors you do, of course, the bigger this forward emission gets. And needless to say, if you do it backwards, what happens is that instead of constructively interfering, they destructively interfere and cut down the gain. So it certainly is possible to get constructive interference using parasitics, but people assume that means that the parasitics have to be arranged like a Yagi to produce out of phase waves. It turns out that's not entirely the case. Another piece of the puzzle. So now we have constructive interference, which produces gain, and we have the ability to do this using parasitics. So here's something you may not know about. You've already seen this, and I'm, I'm actually very grateful to Dr. Bruckner for incorporating it in his talks because a lot of people just don't realize it or don't want to accept the fact that Marconi and his colleague Franklin are the inventor of metamaterials. So uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, the definition you heard today of metamaterials, but to be more specific from an electromagnetic standpoint, it's, it's probably more accurate to say that they're, uh, metamaterials are a close space array of resonators. When I mean close space, I mean very, very close in terms of wavelength and they're used to produce electromagnetic effects. Uh, are they artificial materials not found in nature? 
I, I'm not going to address that issue. I think you do find some of this stuff in nature. But certainly, it's very unusual to take resonators and put them very close to one another and see what the effects are. And sure enough, you know, uh, Dr. Berkter did, did point out this right here, which is a blow up from the Marconi and Franklin patent. And it took, as far as I'm aware, 85 years for someone to finally model that. And the point is, is that when you do it, you find out something really kind of interesting, which is that when you closely pack small elements, these H shapes here are actually uh, shortened dipoles there with end caps, and they're right next to each other, very small separation, about a 30th of a wavelength. It's so small you can't even see it on this picture. If you make a dipole from this, meaning if you take one of these guys and feed it and look at the current distribution, what you see is that this one here lights up the one next to it, lights up the one next to it, lights up the one next to it, and so on and so on and so forth. So although Marconi and Franklin didn't discuss that, that's the phenomena that they were exploiting. It's called evanescent excitation. It actually is the main principle behind capacitors. So it's more of an ignored effect as opposed to one that wasn't fully understood. But as far as I'm aware, no one actually went and bothered to even model this until 85 years after Marconi did it. Well, this seems to be an effect that requires small elements. Because if you use large elements and you put them next to each other, they interact in a way that detunes the elements themselves. Everyone knows this when they try to make Yaggies, you try to make the elements too close, the SWR goes away and the tuning goes to another frequency. So there seems to be some advantage in terms of, uh, of trying to make the system work by using a smaller element. And of course, you know, what we just saw was, whoops, nice family, by the way. Did I just turn this off? Press it again? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so um, what I want you to do is to think of not just being able to make small elements in these H shapes, but maybe there's some other way that you can shape these elements. And what I'm giving is an, exa an example of a fractal. There's lots of examples. You're seeing this one commonly, mainly because it's the easiest one people seem to understand better than many others. But there's lots of fractal shapes. Some of them are better for other than others in terms of what you're trying to accomplish for a given problem. So what I'm showing here is, here's a case of a fractal loop. It's called a Minkowski fractal. And what I've done is I've shown a folded dipole in comparison for size. So in free space, at resonance, at the slowest resonance, this is about an eighth of a wave by an eighth of a wave. And here it is modeled. You can't really see it very well. But what really happens is you get two current maxima, which are only an eighth of a wave apart. And because they're only an eighth of a wave apart, you're still getting constructive interference. So that means you're getting a little bit of gain. Now, at the same time, you're getting losses because if you follow along this path, that's a long inductive length here. Length equals loss. So you're increasing the loss with this kind of structure, but you're also increasing the gain. And the two, basically, on most scales, cancel each other out. So even though you have more loss by using the fractal, you also have higher gain. So the practical uh, directivity that you measure, call it gain if you want, uh, is very close to a real dipole. For example, sure enough, you get a figure eight dipole. This is an only an eighth of a wave by an eighth of a wave. This gain says 1.73 dBi. That's including losses. A lossless dipole, a full size, is about 2.1 dBi. So you can see this is, this is a pretty good antenna for a small antenna. Um, it took a long time for people to accept this, and I'm going to show you an example of validation. This is one that came in 2007 and actually was published by researchers in Iraq. <laughs> I'm big in Iraq, I guess. In any case, uh, what you see is they've got a confirmation that the size reduction is dramatic. They can get it down about 54 percent uh, reduction. And the characteristics in terms of gain and pattern and so on seem to be independent of the iteration that you do. In other words, making it smaller and smaller and smaller by applying the, uh, the fractal pattern. So this is, this is well-known stuff and has been verified. It's not uh, something on the edge of, uh, edge of reality, as they say. Well, 
interesting thing is what if you take these fractal elements and now put them very close to one another and do a phased array and it turns out you get a very interesting result. This is actually done back in 2002 uh, under a DARPA study <clears throat> and I could give a backstory on that if anyone's interested after the talk but what I have here is is a rectangle of these fractal elements. They're each being fed in phase and that separation between each one is about a sixteenth of a wave so the each about an eighth of a wave. So you can see it's a very very small patch that you're trying to see how much gain you can get out of it. Now if you try to do that with two dipoles you could only fit basically two dipoles separated by about three eighths of a wave. So the point is, is that you have just two dipoles you wouldn't be able to get anything like the gain that you're actually seeing. The gain you're seeing if, if you put it in here is 6.8 dBi. If you put a back plane in here, this has no reflector, you're going to pick up another 3 dB. So the gain you'd see if you put a back plane is about, you, this guy would disappear or just be forward and you'd get about almost 10 dBi. Now it turns out that that is uh, something called <coughs> super gain, meaning the amount of gain that you're getting from that structure is higher than what you expect from its actual aperture, the amount of the area that it takes up. So one way of looking at this, this is the way I like to say it, is that you're basically sampling the near field, meaning the close spacing of one element to the next, much better with a fractal. And because you're able to sample it, you're able to add mo constructively more waves together, and that's how you're getting the gain. So, so far we've got a situation where we know there's constructive interference, there's evanescent waves, um, you know that you now can make some very interesting small elements with fractals. So it'd be kind of fun, for example, to make one of these. Let's see what it does. Notice there's no side lobes on this antenna. So uh, I could talk about super resolution and so on. That's an interesting talk in itself. If anyone wants to talk about it later, I'd be happy to, to go through that slide. But the bottom line is that when you build one, this one's a three by three, and you actually phase it up, this is a splitter assembly, you get something interesting. You get a main lobe, and then you get these end, end fire lobes off on the side. So they would be coming out on the plane this way rather than the normal that way. So the intensity of these guys, by the way, it's bent a little bit because there's a bit of a copper plate at an angle here. So there's some kind of wave that's following along here. But these end fire lobes, the ones you don't want to see, are as intense as the main lobe. So what the heck is that? It's a weird behavior. Uh, you know it's not grading lobes. There's no physics that would tell you how to get those lobes based on the, that, that uniform but limited spacing you have in the array. It's not something called a creeping wave, which is a fancy way of saying diffraction. Uh, because no one knows how to make diffraction that strong compared to the main lobe. Uh, so it turns out that uh, you're actually making, uh, can make lemonade out of lemons of this using uh, and explaining the phenomena as surface waves. So let me tell you what surface waves are. They're waves that are confined to a dielectric surface that re-radiate as a traveling wave when they hit a discontinuity. In other words, when they get to the end of the line, they then become a traveling wave. Otherwise, they just stay on the surface and propagate until they get to the end. And they keep on adding up because you're turning on each one of these elements together constructively. It's caused by differential in dielectrics or metal surfaces. It's well known. There are surface wave antennas. They're okay, they serve their purpose, but they're not as, uh, as gainful as, as what I'm discussing here. Here's a nice little graphic that shows the idea that each one of these guys lights up the next one, the next one, the next one. The intensity going this way falls down dramatically, but the intensity going along the surface in the direction, in this case end fire, keeps on adding up. So those are the main physics pieces of the puzzle which I just mentioned, uh, we're trying to use fractals because it really gives you an efficient resonator element that you can pack very closely to another one and uh, end up with a lot of gain. So we know about evanescence, we know about using parasitics, these are not directly fed, uh, we know about constructive interference, we know about surface waves. Okay, so here's an interesting question. Let's go back to the Marconi-Franklin example and, hmm, 
that's cool. I mean, if, I'll let the interested student figure out what happens when you go and model this. I'll, I don't want to ruin it for you, but you will get gain. The bottom line is, what if you made a whole bunch of these together that used evanescent waves so they lit up the next column or the next row and so on? Well, this geometry is not set up to do that. This is really set up to, to get a line of evanescent waves. In other words, this isn't going to work. You can't get an area that's filled with these that are all going to light up. But you can do this. So this little uh, interesting doily pattern is actually, if you can see them, an individual fractal loop next to an individual fractal loop next to an individual fractal loop next to an individual fractal loop ad nauseum. So they keep on going and they're actually on this surface which closes in on itself. It's a loop. And the size of these units that we're going to show you is 13 millimeters by 11 millimeters, and this separation is about two and a half millimeters. So the objective is, obviously it took a long time to get here to understand this, is to do this. In other words, we're going to take a dipole, and just like in a Yagi, this is not a Yagi, by the way, I'll tell you why in a second. Just like in a Yagi, we're going to put this stuff of, of parasitic elements in front of it, and then we're going to see what kind of gain we get from it. By the way, the reason it's not a Yagi is because Yagis, at least in general, are not devices to make surface waves. They're devices that are parasitic that use traveling waves. That's how the excitation happens. So we built this. And let me explain very quickly what you're seeing. This is a reflector and a dipole, reflector, dipole. And this is, we call them cards, but this is that collection of little fractal metamaterial elements. And we're exciting it very, very short distance away, a very small fraction of a wavelength uh, from the dipole itself. And what I'm going to show you is, and we're going to do this demo, uh, at least on the card, we're going to get the reflector out of the way. Here's what a dipole looks like. So what we did is we look, took the SWR of a small dipole. This guy resonates at about 2.1 gigahertz. And what we did is we normalized the intensity. In other words, we said, let's, let's say that we want to measure something compared to a dipole. So if you do that, obviously the dipole is going to be pretty much zero across the whole line. Maybe there's some minor reflections. This is from 1.5 to 2.5 gigahertz. These are 5 dB steps. And we're trying to superpose an SWR curve on a gain curve, and unfortunately, the VNAs we use don't let you display both uh, Y axes. So these are units of SWR of 1, 2 to 1, 3 to 1, and so on. These are units of 5, 10, 15 dB. All right, so again, what we're doing is we're looking at this. We're taking this dipole, putting a reflector in back of it, and then put one of these fractal metamaterial cards, which we now call FMR technology. This is acting as a lens. Let's see what the whole thing looks like. So the gain has gone up dramatically. And in fact, it peaks at about 13 dB above the 13 dBD. And, and you can also see the SWR. It's loaded a little bit down in frequency. And I can flip the two here so you can see it. It's, a, it's about 4% shift. Whoop. <laughs> So that's the kind of behavior you would expect from a Yagi. And in fact, when you plot the azimuthal curve of this, it looks a lot like a Yagi. You get a lot of nice forward gain. You get really, whoop, really nice front to back. Uh, someone would tell you uh, they had a Yagi and had this curve and say, yeah, sure, it makes sense to me. So this Yagi that we're looking at, although it's not technically one, would have a gain of about 13.5 dBD at 2.2 gigahertz. The problem is, is that it's not a Yagi. So the way it was produced is with surface waves, and the structure you're using to do it is far smaller than a Yagi. And here's a comparison of the sizes. So this, this would be a Yagi that would produce that amount of gain. It's got a, uh, a folded dipole for bandwidth. And here's the respective size of that FMR, that fractal metamaterial structure that gives the same gain. So you can see this particular one is about half the size. Oh, well, we can go back and see it. So this is from 
uh, about 1.85 gigahertz to about 2 gigahertz. So it's about 150 megahertz with a center of about 2. So that's what 9, 10%. Now, needless to say, the dipole is also uh, about 9 or 10%. In other words, it's not a high Q device. All right, so the point is, is that, so what? Well, the point is, is, is if, if you try to figure out for a given gain what you'd get for an NBS Yagi in comparison, you'd have to have an MBS Yagi that's basically twice the boom length, that's what this says, to uh, have the same gain as this lens antenna made from the fractal metamaterials. So the fractal metamaterials are giving you uh, a high amount of gain, and it's very easy to construct this, and they're doing it at a much smaller form factor. The other thing you can do is you can change the form factor. Instead of that form factor being in this direction, you can have most of the form factor going in this direction. And again, you're still taking all these little guys and exciting them, and they're adding up constructively. So what I'm saying is you can even shrink it more this way and get it wider that way and end up with the same gain. So what I've drawn here is uh, is a Yagi and one of these fMR antennas uh, with the same gain and shown you the relative form factors. Now we have this, we're going to show this to you in just a few minutes. All right, so uh, I'm moving on. Uh, you know what, I'm just going to let Ryan come up and he's going to instruct me on what he'd like me to do. Guys, you're going to have to help me set this up. I thought you were going to set up while we're doing this, so... We're going to run through the whole thing. They're actually going to show you the calibration sequence and uh, getting everything up. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for enjoying the talk so far. Uh, what we're going to do for you right now is we're going to recreate one. Where do you guys want to put this? OK. Um, we're going to be removing a couple of factors. So what we're looking at here is a fat dot pool uh, with a through cal to a core antenna that we have on the other end. Uh, the horn antenna is rated uh, right around the same as the fat uh, that we'll ever look at. <coughs> Notice they won't let me touch it, they're afraid I'm going to break it. <laughs> probably right. So we're, we're choking the heck out of the coax. You can see I've got this little, little uh, fat dipole here on the other end. Let's make sure it's lined up. And what they're going to do is they have, uh, this is a little network analyzer. They're really tiny these days. Fed into the computer for the display. And then the output from the computer is going to be going up on, um, hopefully, on the screen. OK. It helps to have some juice. By the way, all this was really fun to get to security. <laughs> Chip, can we cook the rabbits if we put the uh, rabbits between the two antennas there? That's how we're preparing dinner, actually. Oh. I'm going to turn the microphones over to Ryan. Oh, I see. Exactly. We, we, we brought our own. We, I'd like to make sure uh, have our bases covered. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Everything all right in the room? But they are trying to record. So right. Yes. Yeah. 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 We're both like both microphones. Yeah. Yeah. Once you're screaming, once you're the little clapping. You guys haven't done the SWR cal. Oh, uh, so we have done an SWR cal on uh, port one here. Let me show it's correct. Um, we have that ahead of time. Can we just plug we can, the HDMI cord into your computer there? Yeah. That way everybody can see it on the screen here. Put on the screen here. Yeah. Yeah. See, the HDMI cord will run that far, is my only concern. You can sit down. You just have to run your, uh, from the no, 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 no. volume to your, to your computer there. It's so small. Zoom in. <laughs> oh, okay, I see. So if we were to take this HDMI cord out of this laptop, move over to the other one. Yeah. Um, how's the that? Pretty good. Microphones up. Uh, 
And then this will just go in my pocket, I suppose. Yeah, so this, this horn antenna is vertically polarized. It's a 9 dBi antenna. Obviously, there's reflections that we can't get rid of, but we're not interested at that level of uh, sensitivity of measurement. We're just trying to show you a difference measurement between just looking at a dipole and then putting one of these fractal materials in front of it as a lens. All right, so we are moving over to the full screen here. Yep. And everything works. Great. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's that It's very rare when that happens. <laughs> a little more. All right, great. A little, little more. Good. So we are going to go with a through cal because we're in a new uh, environment here. We are going to normalize between the fat dipole and the uh, horn that we have on the other end. The horn is going to act as our pickup antenna through all the experiments. We're not going to change that. I am turning on all the displays now. Okay, great. So. Uh, just to start off, this yellow trace you see here is the SWR cal. I just think there's a bit going on with the tightness of the coax, which should explain some of that texture that you see to that. That should be a smooth curve. So this dipole, whoops. <laughs> Doesn't help to touch it. <laughs> so this dipole has an SWR uh, beginning at 2 to 1 of about 1.7 gigahertz up to about 2.15 or 2.1 gigahertz. And what Ryan's doing now is he's normalizing S12. So what he's saying is here's the dipole relative to itself and gain. So the yellow is SWR and the gain once he calibrates it will be gain compared to a dipole. All right, Great. there we so, are. So yeah. now we're, we're normalized at zero dBD because we are using a dipole. And I'm just going to put my hand in front of it. Sure enough, you're going to see it goes down again. If I get real close, it will start changing the SWR. You can see it shifts totally out of order. So one of the things that we want to make sure is not going on is the structures on the, or the structure for the FMR tech, meaning the, the foam separator, the CPL, these things aren't acting as a waveguide and those things aren't giving us the gain. So what we have here is a blank card. Uh, it's made of the same material. We've just etched off all of the uh, actual traces. Styrofoam in the center, uh, electrically transparent tape, and uh, this is polyester substrate with a dielectric constant of three and a half. And what you're gonna see is, you're actually gonna see a little bit of surface wave here. Let's see if we can get this to go well. Mm -hmm. And there we are. So what you can see is... There's virtually no change. No significant difference. So we, we know it's not the foam. We know it's not the CPL. But what we can do now... The experiment. <laughs> what we can do now is we can now swap in the actual FMR card, which looks something like this for on the front row. We can pass these around if you're curious and getting a closer look at this. If I swap the cards, and I'm very, very close, I move away, immediately you can see the gain goes up. Um, Would you read that down? We are looking at where the marker is. We're looking at about 9.6 dBD of gain. From a Which is 11.6. And it's a very simple structure. It's, it's a small piece of foam and CPL. It's very lightweight. Uh, it, it's a totally passive instrument that's getting us 10 dB of gain with no reflector on the back. So our window here starts from one and goes all the way up to three. We're a little bit wider than the first set of data we showed, just one so we can understand what's going on. This is 1.9 gigahertz, about right here. 
Here's two key gear to turn. So to put the card back in, now that you know the scale of the window, you can see that the card is also working very broad band. Yeah. It's, it's not a high Q at one frequency. It's, we get a peak of 9.6 dB of gain, but we're over 5 dB. And there's no reflector here. This is just that structure in front of the dipole. So from 1.4 gigahertz to 2.56 gigahertz, we're looking at at least 5 dB of gain over the dipole. No, it's more than five, it's a nine dB. This is nine dB. Oh, I know that's a peak, I'm, I'm saying it's a wide bandwidth as well. All right, yep. The gain will get down as you go. Mm -hmm. So uh, why don't you show them the last trick, which is uh, going back to the phase array. Oh, uh, sure. So we showed you what the simulations were with the fractal and material structure as a phase array. So what if you actually fed that parasitically with a wave and back it? What you can do is you can take this horn, for example, and you get several dB increase in gain by doing that. So this structure that Ryan's holding, the plastic is just a, a holder to attach it. It contains two of these fractal and material areas in front, and I'll let you see what the gain is. Yeah, they are a little bit hidden. Uh, it's, it's basically a sheet underneath and above this foam spacer here. So in this case, the fractal elements are actually oriented 90 degrees differently from how we just saw on the dipole here. So if we're looking again at zero, now we're using the horn as our source and the dipole as our pickup antenna. And we're gonna put on one of these little structures. And the game goes Even when the, uh, the sheet's oriented 90 degrees rotated, uh, we can still see an improvement of gain over our control. That's, that's peaking at about uh, 3.8 dB. So certainly you get a lot of end fire gain by doing these structures, but you can also get broadside gain at a much lesser degree. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead and put you on the last one. Okay. So the last structure that we have here is one of the models that, sure. So we now have one of the um, models that we showed in the PowerPoint presentation. It's doing essentially the same thing. It's still the, the cells. This time we have the entire card oriented vertically, trying to cut down on the amount of distance it needs to span out. Uh, we also have a reflector on the back of this one. And this one is a little bit smaller in terms of its area, so the gain will be down about 2 dB. But instead of having that card go out this way with the Yagi, we're letting it go vertically for the most part. It turns out from a practical standpoint, on antenna mounting, you don't want to have a lot of torque, you don't want to have a lot of imitation of vandalism, uh, you know, you don't want to have birds sitting on your antenna. So <laughs> anything that's closer to the actual mounting position at all, giving you the same gain as before. So we're just running and grabbing a bullet from the other room, uh, our, our box of goodies, and a whole bunch of other things. But we do need to have one more bullet to connect this. Now, what we'll find is because we have a reflector on the back here, the distance that reflector is uh, sort of set our high Q or our, our best frequency here. So it won't be quite as broad band as the previous example, but we will get more gain at a selected frequency with it. Thank you. Murphy hasn't struck yet, I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> We've got them shot up. Let's <laughs> <laughs> see opportunities. All right, there we are. And let me try to get that game for you here. And see our SWR is narrowed a little bit, but we get uh, a better efficiency right at the uh, middle of that frequency. So you're getting 10 and a half dBD, which is 12 and a half dBi from that structure. The equivalent Yagi, of course, would not be that tall, mm -hmm. but it would be about that long. So it's dramatically shorter in the horizontal gears. Well, it leverages the all the or the uh, gain that dipoles will uh, take advantage of, sort of above their own structures. So uh, it, it, there's a lot of space, that, like above the dipoles, that we can light up with these elements and take advantage of. Uh, what we found is more important than anything else is the area of the card itself, the number of cells. Uh, that generally correlates to how much gain we'll get off of any given card. 
What happens when you rotate at 90 degrees? The entire structure? Yes. Uh, the structure is really polarized, so if we rotate it. No, no, he wants to, what he means is this. You mean yes. an azimuth? Yes. Oh, azimuth. He wants to okay. see the evanescent way to go down. No, 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 no. I, mean, I did mean. Oh. oh. Okay. I just want to look at the polarity. Sure, sure, sure. They're both, yeah. They're both good questions. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. So you check if I go to stable. Okay. There we go. Yeah. So you can see the gain goes down dramatically. It, it's polarized the same way as the dipole is. So you polarize the other one. Exactly. Now if we do rotate it and... Yeah, rotate it as it is. Yeah. And I promise everyone will be fine if I point it at you. <laughs> yeah, you, you won't get fried. So the gain is now peaking at about uh, 0 dBd. It's gone down 10 dB. So the front to side on this structure is about 10 dB. Can you do front to back? Well, the only problem measuring front to back, we're happy to try, mm -hmm. is it's really hard to isolate the feed. You can see you get a bunch of chokes. Yeah. But sure, we'll, we'll try rotating. Let's see what it does. It does that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really doesn't want to. <laughs> there we go. Do you want to hand I think. Take some of the chores. Exactly. Thank you. Jim's going, get your hand out. I know, I know. Press the kill switch. There we go. That's not bad. What's that? So that's like 25 dB. The reflector's doing a lot of work here. And so is my back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got it. You can let go. I think thanks, so. Sir, thanks, thanks very much. We're happy to take any questions. Appreciate it. Can you sort of hand a card around? Yeah, there, there's sure. the, we're calling it the card. The card is passed around. It's going around now. Do we have questions? Just appreciate getting it back afterwards. Do you have questions for the demo before we take it all down? Well, not the demo, but I'm just curious. Isn't it? How low in frequency can you go with this thing? If that's like a very complicated. That's an excellent question. Obviously, we're interested in the practical sense. Yeah. You're not going to make a 160 meter Yagi out of this. <laughs> we think that it's probably not practical to now below about 500 megahertz. So this is not an HF, HF antenna solution, but it is a pretty good solution for a variety of applications. Of so how big would it look at 500? How big would it be? Yeah. So you're scaling for that amount of gain. You're scaling a factor of four. Do you want the microphone back for? Are there a variety of <coughs> fractal patterns that would work similarly? That, that's, thank you for asking that question. Um, it isn't, obviously there's an infinite number of fractal patterns. The question is which ones optimize best for this effect. And early in the game, we did use a genetic algorithm to try that. The problem is it takes too long to do the simulations because you can see how many segments there are, even on each individual loop. So when we did those simulations that I showed you earlier, granted it was a number of years ago, but it typically took two or three days to run it. Now it would probably take an hour to run it. Um, so we haven't done that optimization. We wanted to show it when we effect, and in my opinion, you're not gonna pick up more than one or two DB more by finding you know, the optimized fractal shape that works. Any other questions? Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you.